probably should get going, but um, I can start with um, let me make sure no one else is outside. I doubt it, but I think we're just you can even leave it open if you want to sort it. Okay, um, let me just start off a real quick. Um, thank you for coming. That's such an early session. Um, how many here have had? Some exposure to SPX. Well, let me let me rephrase it. How many people here is relatively new to? They're relatively new to SPX. Okay. Um, I'll be referencing SPX, but I won't be explicitly going into any overview of SPX. However, um, there's a lot of good resources for you guys to start, and I'll be more than happy to address any questions you might have about trying to understand it. After, um, this is very relevant to a lot of people who work with SPX files. But believe me, you're going to, if you're in licensing, this is going to, you're going to identify with the content. For those, um, whether you are really plugged into SPX or not, there's a survey. Um, this card is available, but I guess you can go to the spx.org site slash survey and provide some, any, um, just fill out the survey to provide feedback about what you know or don't know about it. Okay. And also, also worth, Noting is there's um this is a session today of SPX tools, and following this presentation um, is a, a two sessions on talking about the neat tools that are available to us to um, leverage SPX data, and Gary will be leading that session. Okay, so without further to do, um, everybody can hear me, right? I'm not sure. Okay, so um, today I'm going to pr um, present what I often call my presentation on License to Kill. And uh, this is work that's done in a, a team I participate with, um, Samir Hamed, Elisa Seneva, who's over here, um, and uh, two other people, Morella and um, Mihai. And um, very fortunate to have worked with them because we come up with a lot of good stuff together. Standard disclo disclaimer here. Um, basically, this does represent the opinions of the presenter. And not the organization organizations previously worked for or currently working for. Okay, um, and of course this is not legal advice, etc. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off like any good movie with a really great scene, right? <laughs> but I, seriously, this is um, for people 17 or older. So anybody who's under anything, please please approach. Um, this comes off of um, <clears throat> Twitter. And this actually tweet has gotten a lot of attention. It even, even has a Wikipedia page dedicated to it. And this is a viewpoint um, that is not necessarily held by a huge number of people in the world, but there's quite a few people who feel strongly that licensing is a real annoyance or it's in the way. Okay? And so um, he's even gone so far as to talk about some new movement called the post open source software, which actually, there's nothing wrong with that notion. I just think that. There's a lot of confusion in the world, and we're going to get to that. Now, this is a follow-up tweet, which I think he brought some, you know, a grounded, clean, cut response to it, saying, hey, you know, you're making your stuff unusable for us suits. Now, I personally think that it's not just the suits. It's all the open source projects, right? If you don't do licensing, it's all about share and share alike. It's, that's at the core of the open source movement. And so, I mean, it's not just the companies that are getting hurt by this. Now, he had a follow -up, another follow-up tweet, which I thought was very succinct and really assist, you know, captured the essence of, of what the potential problem is, right? You're basically going to create a, a, a situation where you have licensing that's going to spread like a disease, okay? And so um, I usually start my presentation off here, but I thought it was really important to set the stage about some of the thinking that's going on. Now, there are a lot of people who don't quite understand licensing. For very, there's, there's a whole spectrum of, dis, you know, of misunderstanding. But what's really key for anybody to understand is this, and I know most of the people here in the room are very familiar with licensing and open source, but I want to put together a sequence of ideas to make a point at the end. Right? And what we know is the most important thing, the only thing that makes a piece of software open source is the license. You can have a piece of software, and I can give it to Jack under uh, a proprietary license, and it's proprietary to him, and I can give the same software to Samir under an open source license, and it's open source to him. That's it. That's the only thing that makes a piece of software open source. It's the license. Okay? 
Now, I want to make it clear that I'm very well aware that the open source movement is much, much bigger than that. It's a development model. It's a community. It's peer recognition, right? Many eyeballs effect. But at the end of the day, um, the license enables the sharing, and it's the core pillar of the movement. And simply put, no license, no movement. Okay. Now, licenses, um, all, you know, they represent developers' wishes. They don't ask much in return. They don't get money for their code, right? But what they do do is they ask possibly for some attribution or share my code with others, right? And you know, to us or to many others, not us, we might be open source developers as well, but to many of us, we're users of it, and these just represent our you know requirements for distribution. And we're all familiar with the types of requirements that we see in licenses, right? Even the famous buy me a beer condition. Okay. Now, I thought it was just appropriate. I'm not trying to define open source. I just want to use this as an opportunity to define a new term for the sake of this presentation. Okay? So open source software. Really is basically, you know, freely available stuff, free of charge, right? That gives you pretty good um, rights to easy rights to use, modify, and distribute. And we could uh, debate that all day about exactly the great definition of open sources, but I'm hoping that captures the basic essence. However, promiscuous source is source code that's out there, and there's plenty out there where you're granted no rights, right, to use it. And if you're a company or an open source project and you bring it into your project or your company, you actually are putting yourself at risk, right? And so um, I'm obviously leveraging the term promiscuous from one of the tweets, and um, I think it's 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 just a stir of the, you know, to bring people more aware. Actually, before I go to the G part, um, I thought I'd just bring up a simple example, um, just to ground this a little. Now this is GitHub. This is a very innocent project. Okay, the person actually wrote some pretty good code. It's um, without going. You can read about it if you want. It's in, it's in the presentation. Um, it's basically looking at a, a jQuery for animated functions. And basically, there's no license information at the top. And if I drill down, there's some really um, good source code here, but no license at all to be found. OK. Now, I can, you, you can look at all the files. I, this, is, this is not the, you know, the I, I, don't, I would guess the intent was not to inhibit sharing. In fact, they probably really want their code to be used by a lot of people. But unfortunately, they, they didn't choose a license. so. Technically, at least in this discussion, I'm claiming it's not open source. Okay. All right, now the G part. All right, those who are under 17 can come back in. Um, this is a simple game. Um, some of you may have seen it once before. I've done it once before. But essentially, um, it's a game where you see a figure, and you come up and you tell me what you see. All right? So a common, you know, when you look at something, one person might say, I see a gift wrap. With a bow, he didn't see it, but some some people claim that they see a, a man's bow tie being caught in the elevator. Now, all of a sudden, you had an aha moment, right? <laughs> all right. Now, this is a very another famous one. This is um, I, you want to take some guesses here? It, it could be anything. It, it, there's no clear. Um, some people claim um, they see knots in a rope. Right. Some claim they see beads on a necklace. And some even claim they see a bear climbing a tree. Now, if you don't see it right away, it's okay. These are the paws, and he's shimming up, and you can't see him. He's behind the tree. If you want to get a little help here, there he is. All right? But you had an aha moment, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, you saw something that you didn't see before because someone helped you see it. Okay? You know that. Um, so that's my final doodle. The license of BusyBox. Binary. Not package. Binary. What do we have? We have some people see GPL2, right? Some people see something a little bit more involved. <laughs> um, and it just depends. It could be just GPL2. It depends how you configure it. But more often, it looks like this or this. Because BusyBox, you can build it with many different configurations, including some files but not others. And I'll give you an example why that is true. Because traditionally, we think of BusyBox as a GPL2 because that's what we all think of, we're told, right? So BusyBox, by the way, is a fantastic open source project in terms of the richness of the sharing that went on in its history. And that's why it has so many licenses in there. It's a good thing. More licenses, it's, it's fine. But, um, and so that's going to happen to any open source project that is out there and very popular. So we have to be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of sharing going on, and licensing is also very relevant to that. 
So for those who are not as familiar with licensing, this is probably will help you a little. So in BusyBox, you'll see lots of files. For example, there's signal.c, it's under DPL. You'll have runshell.c, it's under MIT, okay? And you even have files with more than one license in it, okay? And this is a little um, odd to some, but after you've looked at a lot of code, you, you see this all the time. So here's the, uh, the BSD notice in the file. The purple is a GPLv2, and, it, and then there's, here's the MIT notice, okay? Just to give you an example. So these are real files out of BusyBox. So if you're going to build a library, you have to look at all the licensing that goes into that library, or from which that library is derived from. And then you end up with this, and then you end up with that expression. That's how we got the BusyBox binary. I'll give you a little bit more details on that. So now you have several libraries that get built. They each have a set of libraries, right? And then naturally, you can then deduce the licensing of BusyBox, which looks something like this. OK? All right. So we've already discussed how BusyBox can be licensed like this, or this, or this. Now, it's a point I make all the time, and it's not always received well, but um, the package license is far less relevant, particularly in the embedded world, for this reason. What you really care about is what programs get put on your device, what files go into or to building that, that binary, and that tells you your obligations. Conversely, um, files that you know, we, we just seen, the files that are you know, from which it's derived from are highly relevant. And that, you know, basically, this is determining your obligations and not the package license. Okay. So I often draw this analogy because it's, sometimes it's fun. Files, I call them, they're the atomic unit of licensing. I know we have discussions yesterday and very valid discussions around snippets, and that doesn't, pre that doesn't, this doesn't negate that. There are times when snippets are relevant, such as in reporting, as Gary was pointing out to me. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to ship a binary, a program, on your device. Ultimately, it comes down to the files. Okay, you have to know the licensing of the individual files. If you happen to patch that file, that patch file would be file prime, right? You have to know the licensing of that patch file. But nonetheless, it always comes down to understanding this is the smallest unit of licensing that we have to understand to understand the licensing of our program. Okay? So I always draw this out. I, my son's taking the standard science exam, so I'm pretty at least um, aware of uh, these uh, um, terms. So, um, so then, you know, basically, you'd have files would be the atom, and these the programs would be the molecules. Okay, and so that's the analogy that I want people to think about when they think about licensing. Okay. <laughs> well, those are the only the the, the most uh, advanced of us. Uh, um, I understand. So one thing I also want to draw out is there's a little myth that SPX has to be this very unwieldy list of files and licenses. And that's often the case when you have a package. But if you're going to ship a single binary, you just need a single line with a single expression that tells you your licensing. And in some ways, this captures sometimes the complexity around the bill of material. Right? You, in fact, you bypass that whole complexity, and you put out a file. And, and, this, and by the way, for those who are unfamiliar with um, SPDX, all the license wraps are custom licenses found in the, in the file. And in an SPX file, you can go here and you can find those custom licenses. Okay. Don't worry about it. Most of them, they're all pretty straightforward licenses. Um, and they're all compatible. So yes, we often do want to think about SPDX in terms of a larger package. Um, and if you wanted to, you can see the package SPDX file. I don't want to go through it at any length. But this is what every single file, you know, there's a license for every single file. Here's some, you know, you can see files over here. But the main point is that, you know, it doesn't have to be as complicated. All right, now the PG part. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a series that I revived, and I actually had some fun experience working with Sven Dumer back. Um, he's now at um, Yahoo, director of Linux. And um, we had a lot of fun a couple of years ago. Three years ago, we presented a very similar set of slides. And back then, it was like, if the noise is made in the woods and no one hears it, is it, you know, is it really meaningful? I think today, there's a lot of people to be hearing the noise now. So I decided to repeat that. We brought back the episodes. So in each one, we're going to go look at a, a specific example. So here we have the case of the shamelessly stolen code. 
So again, if you've been through a lot of files, you totally relate to this. This is not new to you. I'm trying to make a basic point, all right? So this is a file, obviously has a notice in it that's very um, easy to deal with. Right? We know what to do. But it also has this additional notice. It says shamelessly stolen from. Now, believe me, we track these things down. And um, what it turns out in this package, this file is nowhere to be found in the package. And it's nowhere to be found even on the net, by that name at least. Okay? So you're kind of left hanging a little. And I would think that this might actually kill their code, <laughs> potentially. Potentially. That's a subject to the lawyers, but um, killing meaning preventing it from being used by many. Okay, the next one is the next episode is the case of the shamelessly missing language. Okay, there's no notice at all other than this in the file. What makes it even more interesting is that when you actually look, there's this file called g711.c. Again, nowhere to be found in the package. However, if you go searching on the net, um, you find one file, and it has this notice in it. Okay. And you go in this one, and also we have the ITU general public license. I don't believe that made the SPDX license list. And I, <laughs> I, I couldn't even find it. So I wouldn't even try to offer it up. Um, and then my, one of my favorite, which you, I'm sure I've come across as well, is the famous, you know, um, I like GPL, but I'm going to give this to the public domain, you slimy people. But what's more interesting about it is the contradiction that's being made here, right? Exactly. It, you can't say something in the public domain and have a copyright. So what is the licensing here? Is this open source? I mean, yeah, you probably get a lawyer maybe to go one way or the other, and it's up to you to find that lawyer. But nonetheless, you're kind of stuck. And again, this is a person who probably you know, meant well enough to have their code be used by a large group of people, but yet license it to be killed, so to speak. OK. All right, the case of the missing link. Again, these are things all you auditors have seen before. You know, the famous, go to this link, and you'll find the license. Well. We know that that link changed over time from GPL2 to GPL3 when the GPL3 came out. Yet this file has 1998 in it. So if you click on the link, you see GPL3. You click on, um, but if you make the deduction, you're probably thinking GPL2. Unfortunately, if you're using this in the GPL2 project, I mean, GPL3 is not compatible. Where do you come down on this? Right? Again, this is, I'm not here to solve the mysteries. <laughs> you know, figure it out. It's just to say there's so many mysteries out there. Um, that sometimes, you know, they're just not licensed to be used. And, you know, there's obviously things they could have done. They could have done something very simple as, you know, this is on the GPL version 2. Don't put links in files. All right? It's very, this is enough. This, we all know what to do with this. Right? And then the next episode we have the who done it. I love this one. Modified by many people. Distributed on the GPL. Now, who do we go talk to to find out exactly which version of the GPL they meant? Um, now, the good news is, if, you know, at least my interpretation of GPL, all three, GPL 1, 2, and 3, say if they don't specify the version, you get to kill. So it's not terrible. But they could have done a little better job. Maybe we could have found out exactly what they intended. Yes. Well, then you might be forced. No, then, then you would, if they don't give you a version, then, and you get to choose, you, you'd be fine because you get to pick GPL 2. I agree with you. That, that's correct. It would allow you to pick version one as well in a different context. You can take that file out of that project and put it into a different project where GPL1 is only you know, used. All right, another one. Um, I love this um, comment. You know, they really probably have strong intentions for sharing. Okay? Really distributable. So I probably can assume I can distribute this file. No problem. I probably can assume I can copy this file. But can I assume that I can modify this file? So it's not compatible with GPL, and it may very well sit in the GPL project. All right. So again, they've licensed their code in a way that makes it unusable. Okay. So there were very simple things they could have did to, you know, to alleviate that problem. So, and they could have chose any one of these licenses. Right. All right. This is the double mystery murder. Um, so this is the README file, the license.txt file, or whatever you want to call it. This is trying to give you instructions on how to interpret the license of a package, which again is a really dangerous thing to do. Um, because what we're looking at, first of all, they're telling us, fine, great. They're telling us, you should be aware these are licenses that, that cover, you will find, you'll find files under these licenses in this package. And we have to be careful because we know some of them are not compatible, but that's not a big deal. We can do that. 
Now, then they tell you that, then we find out after doing our own analysis that there are many more in the package, fine. We're gonna be mindful of that. And then they tell us, you know, any file that doesn't have a license, you, you should assume GPL2. But what happens if they borrowed a file from somewhere else and stuck it in there? And all of a sudden, does this trigger? Do I have a lot of confidence in them that they did that in a very disciplined way? No, I don't. So I'm not feeling very good about that readme file or any file that I find in the package without a license. Okay. And then you have this classic situation where see the copyright file or the license.txt file. And guess what? Not found in the project. And this is not surprising because in open source, it's all about sharing. And somebody probably saw a really cool file in another project, took that file, brought it into their project, and said, great, but they didn't pull along the copy, copyright file. So, you know, this is another, we're going to come back to this. You know, any references to anything outside the file is a very dangerous thing. Or it really inhibits sharing. Okay. Finally, the final mystery is the mushroom roulette mystery. And the classic situation is no license information in the file at all. Okay? So naturally you want to look, people want to look at the top level directory. I generally view copy files as just providing me a copy of a license as required by the license. However, some people make a different interpretation. I think that rule is generally followed by the Free Software Foundation and others, because they generally do put licenses in every single file as well. But then again, the question is, which license do I use? Am I allowed to, probably the safest thing is assume all of them. Okay? And how do I know they didn't borrow this file from another project? and never even gave consideration to these being at the top level. It's really not information I can really bank on. Okay. So there's some simple things they could easily have done. They could have put in um, a notice. And what happens if one of these licenses in the co copying these files was a incompatible license, right? Who would even know which one to choose? All right, but there's some very simple things you can do to a file. So, you know, it's not a huge effort to make it clear. And we all know what to do here. All right, so I think we've, we've seen a lot of examples um, here's another classical example of a, a project done well, all right? Now, there are, there are groups like the Apache Foundation, Free Software Foundation, Eclipse, um, Linux Foundation, where they do a lot of great work around putting the right licenses in. Here you have um, a GitHub project, and at the top level you have a license, a text file. All it does is provide you a copy of the Apache file. No instructions there. That's a good thing. They're probably just trying to satisfy part of their license obligation by providing you a copy. And if I drill down, I'm going to find that um, here's, a, here's one file. And all the files have this. They have a notice in every single file. This is, this is a good thing. This is open source software. This is clear. We know what to do. This is what we should be doing. So I'm not against you know, having a copying file. It's just what purpose it serves. Okay. And I, I can go. Um, this is just another example where um, you have a license file at the top, right? And then if I go down, there's no, um, there's no, there's no information. Um, but there's, um, there's no information in the individual files. How do I know they put that at the top and they didn't pull a file in from somewhere else? This is on GitHub. This is real stuff, right? And this is happening in a big way. I'm pretty. I'm gonna guess. I would. I'm a gamble. I would gamble on it that their intention was not to make this, you know, difficult to use. And what happens if one of your developers grabbed the file out of this project? They probably wouldn't have grabbed the license.txt file. And it probably would have been a legitimate license for you guys. So it's, 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 a, it's a little bit, of, it's a real gnarly situation. Has anybody ever been down to the La Brea tar pits down in LA? Raise a hand. Sorry, I get a sense. Of, I know. Okay. It's, it's, a great, it's a great place to visit. It, it's where there's these tar pits that's still there where um, I think some hundreds of tens of thousands of years ago, prehistoric animals like the saber tooth tiger and Mammoth, Willie Mammoth would walk into this tar pit, get stuck, and you know, and then the more you struggle, the more difficult it gets. Now, I don't know if you know about Fred Book, um, Brooks's book, um, Mythical Man Monkey. Now, he talks about in that book a number of things. One thing was about if you're not really careful about certain disciplines, the software um, development process gets really gnarly, gets <laughs> really um, unmanageable. And I think what we, we are, we're heading towards the tar pit. And what can we do to prevent enough of us from walking into the tar pit, the licensing tar pit? And that's what I'm going to talk about next slide, right? So these are just basic common sense rules. And I believe if you follow these rules, these are not going to be shocking to you guys. But I believe, you know, you're going to, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll come to an agreement that these are probably pretty good rules that if we follow them, we're all going to be in a much better situation when it comes to determining licensing. And the first one is that each, you know, 
you should have a notice for each set of licenses. It's not a bad thing to have multiple licenses cover a file. If you happen to grab code from somewhere else, go along the license notice. Um, second, and this is a very, very important one, which I know is going to be at odds with a lot of the developers because they think it's annoying to have to make, you know, have a notice in every single file, but you don't want to make a reference to anything outside the file. It just creates a lot of nightmares when it comes to sharing. If you're not going to share your code, if you're going to use it within a, same, a single organization, that's fine, you know. But if you have a link or another file, it's high like, likeliness if you have a very popular project that your stuff is going to be used and torn apart and tossed around. Um, again, so this is just a good rule of thumb. Try to keep the copyright holders close together so you might know who to contact if you need to get a different license, right? Um, all right, this one's we're back to R. Um, now, there's a certain movement out there, and there, and I understand it. It's nothing. I don't disagree. There's some people that just can't stand the whole bureaucracy of licensing and the, the the machine behind it. Okay, and that's fine. I think there are licenses for them. Creative Commons Zero. If you just don't care, put Creative Commons Zero license on it, and your stuff will be used very um, widely. And it's very clear what you have to do. If you really want to make a statement. You could always use the WFPL license. Who knows what that license is? Yeah, who doesn't? Okay. Um, <laughs> this is on the net. All right, this is rated R. So anybody understands everything, please leave. Um, this is the um, and basically it's a pretty simple license. Which you know what I you know it's up to your attorneys. Um, they may want to have a different interpretation. If I get this, I'm pretty okay with it. I'm thinking I'm not gonna have a problem. But that's subject to an interpretation. An R one. <laughs> well, this doesn't require you to pass this on. You don't have to. You can build a binary. I didn't say. No, no, no. I'm getting tactical on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, whenever possible, let's give them credit. This doesn't help. No, I agree with you. Okay. Okay. It's fine because you can do that. It says you can do that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, the copying file has a role of providing you a copy of the license, and, and we should all consistently try to do that. Use it for that purpose, not as some guiding rule of how to interpret licensing in a package. Okay. Um, avoid the license that text file. I adamantly, you know, I'm against the use of this. I understand perfectly why it's so great to put it in one place. And it covers everything, but we know that that sometimes goes wrong because you know you pull in something that doesn't apply to it. It's just too dangerous to be um, for the for the benefit. By the way, it's just a good discipline to be able to know every single file to have a notice in every single file. And finally, um, uh, you know, just be careful when you do grab code, you pull over the license information. These are really guidelines that I was trying to offer to developers in the community, and um, I'm going to take a second pass at that. But um, this is also open for um, discussion. This is not, I'm not saying this is the absolute set. Yes. What's that? You provided a six. Uh, all right, we're going to put number eight down. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I will say one thing. If you do all these, generating an SVX file will be much easier with the automation tool that we have in the world. You don't even have to create one. We can create one for you, which is going to lead me to the other point. Um, but you know, then it comes down to that whole question about we've already looked at a bunch of files and we're starting to wondering how, how can we get good quality? You know, you know, what are the techniques? Obviously, you can have a human being, or you can use computer analysis, and we're going to talk a lot more about that in the tools section sessions. Okay, and I don't even want to begin to address those questions because in Samir's presentation, he's also going to talk a lot about quality and how he's found ways to uh, measure it. But um, you know, the other thing to be mindful of is there's producers, there's consumers. In the world, right? And they're different groups. And most of us in the tools group are probably producers, but also some of us, such as Jack, is both producer and consumer. Um, um, but there are many more consumers in the world than there are producers. Um, so I think that you know we have to be mindful of the fact that we have to make it really easy. Think about having the Wikipedia database, but no web browser, right? Um, it's a huge, amazing amount of content, right? You know, a lot of few people produce that relative to the number of people that view it. If we have really good viewing tools, you're going to just open that huge repository up. Okay, quality matters to consumers. Quality presents a challenge. I'm not going to go into it. Great. Like, what I do want to 
have is our start is then conversation around how do we talk about quality because there are going to be tools that generate SPDX and there are going to be people that generate SPDX. And when we give SPDX to our customers, we need to set expectations. Okay, I can't let them think that it's, it's you know it's a high quality file when I know it's generated from a process that's not able to do that. So these are just some definitions, and we're, these are the ones we're using today. These will probably evolve. Maybe as a group, we'll even evolve it further. Um, but we're just trying to start the process. Okay, so we kind of come up with this definitions, and even um, you might have seen these definitions change. On our website, we started talking about you know, if it's machine generated, it was low def. If it was you know, human generated, it was high def. And we kind of threw that out because obviously the tools are going to get better. We like to think of tools we generate high def. All right. Um, so this is the basic um, um, fra uh, framework to discuss this stuff. Naturally, uh, we're seeing today, well, our experiences, we are able to do it very quickly using some automation tools that are SPDX, but the quality isn't very high. We have humans doing it, and the quality is, real, is really high, but it does take a lot more time. And naturally, when you have a curve like this, um, as you move along, you want better quality. You have to, um, uh, you know, either go spend more time or innovate and shift the curve through innovation, so that for the same amount of time, you're getting a higher quality. And Samir um, Hamed is going to talk about that in the tool track that's led by Gary. And then obviously you can keep going and try to strive for this goal. Now, what we know, even if you have a perfect model, the classic statement in the computer science world is, um, I'm talking about whether it's a human or, or a um, computer, garbage in, garbage out. No matter how good your tool is, if our files aren't very good, there's not much our tools or our humans can do to come up with the good SPX data, right? So it doesn't matter. Um, whether it's a computer or a human. And I think that's one of the things we have to, we're going to talk about in a, in a few slides. How do we begin to address that for the benefit of SPX? So what we're saying here is simply this. Look, computer automation, I believe, can only go so far. There's an upper bound. It hits a wall. Um, because computers can't make certain, it's very hard. It takes a lot more effort to get them to deduce things humans can do very easily. And humans can do a little bit better, but it takes a lot more time. And we're going to discuss that in, I think in, in Samir's presentation. And then, but we do see a way of getting here, right? And this is not new. This is kind of been talked about. This is something we're doing at Wind River. We're starting to explore this idea of doing a special kind of tagging to make generation of SPX really easy, particularly with our proprietary and open source solution. Okay, so there is a silver bullet. Now, does everybody know what that phrase comes from, silver bullet? One, in one, um, 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 definition or, or understanding is it's used to kill vampires. The one thing that will kill the vampire, right? And, and for werewolf, well, well, <laughs> and in other realms, it's sometimes talked about. There is a solution that can actually solve the major problem, right? And as we talked about earlier, we have these files, and by simply doing something, which I I, I know it's been talked about at some level, by simply tagging every file with a standard syntax. Like, this is not SPDX. This is something that will enable SPDX to take it to the highest quality in a very fast way. It's simply tagging every single file with a certain syntax, leveraging the SPDX license list. All right? Um, so in this case, we see that, you know, you can, you can leave the notice in the file. This is nothing more. What we are doing is we're trying to develop a syntax at Wind River for our own internal use. All right? Not rocket science. It's just a matter of coming up with the right format that's productive. But you can imagine. If every single file followed the common standard syntax, Gary will tell you he can automate that like in a snap, right? And then, um, you know, if you looked at, you know, math.c, all you have to do is have this at the top, right? It doesn't take much because in some ways we're already doing this, right? <laughs> and we're storing it. Now, the beauty of storing it inside the file is every time that file is forked or, or pulled out of a project into another project, it gets dropped right in. It, all that information is self-contained. It doesn't take a lot of effort. It takes a little bit of discipline. Okay. That's well. Well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about more in Samir's talk. But what we're starting to do is like we're going to take the busy box example. We're going to do that because we have high depth data, and we can go and write a script, inject it just as a demo. We have to start demoing, talking, and you know, communicating and educating. But 
Anyway, so then, um, you know, we can get here with something like that. It's a simple solution, but, you know, it's never technological in an organization. It's always, I mean, it's organizational. It's like getting people and their minds around understanding, first of all, that they're not properly licensing their code. They're licensing it in a way that really hurts their intent to have wide acceptance. And then understanding that all you have to do is a simple disciplined thing, and you can actually have that be leveraged, your code can be leveraged in a big way. Okay. So in summary, we, we saw that file sharing and hence licensing is at the core of the open source movement. Okay. And no license, no movement. There's a vast you know, repository of promiscuous source out there, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. If someone wants to put their code out there with no licensing terms, that's their prerogative. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it hurts the open source movement. And it actually probably, for a lot of people, like Monk Chips, the guy, the tweet, I'm not sure he's doing himself justice. You know? And maybe if he understood that, he would have a different perspective. on it. Most developers or authors uh, want their code to be used widely. That's probably, I, I think this gentleman said this yesterday. Right? That's something you're interested in. Give me credit. But I want to know my code is in all these great products. Right? Um, many unintentionally license their code in ways that kill their chances for wide adoption. It's unintentional, right? And um, you know, it's just a matter of education and coming up with a simple, you know, coding standard really, um, and communicating that effectively. And finally, everybody, everybody wants to see the open source movement thrive. I don't think people are worried about a post open source error or movement. Um, and, you know, file license expressions can go a long way. I think you, everybody here gets that. I've heard conversations around this before, you know, um, that file tagging plus SPDX is a very powerful tip for, for the success of the future of the open source movement. And then, all right, we have one more final episode. This is a, um, this, thanks to Elisa Sineva, who from Z3 a lot of code, found this. Um, this is at just a uh, notice in the code. Uh, Ian Fleming is a um, is a uh, Unix fan um, because it likes me executing. Actually, I think someone pointed out that um, Ian Fleming died before Linux was invented, or Unix was. <laughs> but anyway, it was in the code. <laughs> I thought I'd share that with you. And of course, the last brutal. Of course, you see bears, but probably some people here see tucks. Um, and this one's a little bit rate R rated, not terribly, but um, my last brutal. Here is um, this is a code hanger for a nudist, or it's also a question and answer session. All right. So um, I know most of you guys here, you, you totally get this stuff. It's not like I'm teaching or presenting anything that's going to be new. It's a matter of putting a sequence of ideas together to get us to think about it in a certain way. And um, I think the tool talk is going to really touch on a lot of this stuff um, as well. Any questions? Either a good thing or a bad thing. I, I think I'm a, I'm an incrementalist, <laughs> right? Um, and I think even in Wind River, we have the same kind of challenge even internally. We have small projects and we can start to pilot this and there's large projects I'm not going to mess with, right? But I even think on the large ones, even any new files that are generated moving forward is a big step forward. And a lot of people probably scramble when they're modifying or updating files. If they believe in this, they're going to go back and put them in there. It's, it's not nothing that you can't do now and retro you know, fit that back in the files. Because the licensing information sometimes often is there. But I think that the idea is just for us to understand the problem and just start doing it because it does behoove everybody that does it. Um, and I think even if you start with one project and you got them to all do it, and then you went to another project, and they said, well, we're not going to mess with those files. We haven't touched those in 10 years, but all new files will do it. I think it's very legit. I don't, let's not assume a perfect world immediately. But as long as moving forward, we start doing that. And that's exactly how the approach we're taking. And as far as projects, what we're going to do is um, we'll talk a little bit more, but you know, we're going to kind of annotate. The reason why BizBox is not just because it's litigated, but it's a wonderful project. It's a, it represents the history of sharing, and it's got all this rich licensing information. And they've done a lot of work cleaning it up. 
And we're going to use that as an example, and, and, and people see examples, it goes a long way. You know, we'll start, it's a process, it's just the beginning. Yes, Daniel. But. No. No. Okay. That's right. But you as an open source project, you as an open source project, you're probably going to borrow someone else's code. So you're going to put your stuff in there. And the guy who does use your project, who cares about licensing, will find your project not very desirable. Look, I actually think in the... By the way, Daniel, I'm all, I'm all for it. If the project doesn't want to do it, that's all. That's just their business. It's a preference. That's okay. It's just it's it's not going to be usable by us. And if they don't want us to use it, that's that's maybe what they should do. But I'm not against that. I'm not you know I'm not even representing Wind River when I say this. I'll, I'll say any any entity or uh, corporate or open source. If you care about the usability and the wide adoption of your software, this is important. That's it. That's it. And if someone doesn't buy that, they don't buy it, and their stuff is just not going to have the same um, comfort. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there will be some organization, whether they're corporate or, or non-profit open source, that will say, we're not going to accept that. Debian is one. Uh, you know, Wind River might be another one. You know? um, so it's a, it's a choice. Every, every author has a choice. What we're trying to do is educate them to say, if you really want your stuff used widely, 
take follow these simple rules. And if you if you're not if you don't want to put that effort in, my son doesn't want to brush his teeth. He's going to get cavities. You know, that's just the reality. You know, and he may be okay with that. You know. So we do have some kind of min minimal efforts that we do because it's a very highly intense resource intense because we have millions of files <laughs> and, and in, so um, from time to time we do reach out um, and when we need a really important file we really want it in we'll try to get that clarification but it's not feasible for many of them <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think some that, that's very much in the spirit of SPDX. That I think if SPDX as a, as a effort got to this point where they had this universal repository um, and that information was brought into that kind of project, SPDX is a great way to solve that problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it, it sounds like a really pragmatic and useful thing to do. That's a slightly that's a that's a different that, that that well that's a common situation where something goes and it moves along the, the supply chain and it gets added to and then you have to update licensing information along the way yes but I think what you're saying is well when we come across this you know core atoms and we find that you know someone learns something I call it tribal knowledge and we do kind of have a limited effort to collect up tribal knowledge around information on a given file and record that and share that. At the file level. Something like that. That's possible. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for coming on the early session. And um, uh, next, we're going to have the tool talk track. Um, looks like some really neat demos are coming up. Um, and I'll turn it over to Gary. Um, well, actually, you have a few minutes to get ready, but you have ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs>